Okay. Hi, Louise. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> I guess our standoff yeah. is over. We, we, our standoff we're back is to over, normal now, listeners. <laughs> listeners, we just had a little standoff and I called her Susan. So that's where my brain's at. And mm -hmm, I have because had my we... magic mind. <laughs> yes, I had mine too. Mine too. We oh, are, right. she called me Susan because in our chapter review, The Girls Who Went Away by Ann Fessler, um, the first chapter we're discussing today is Susan 2. Yeah, and this Susan was, 2. You know, not unlike all the other stories in yeah. this book. Sad. We were just talking off camera too that the next two women had some different things in here than we've had a little bit. And um, Right. Just, so the one yeah. thing that was interesting is that when her baby was born, um, the the only female in the way you know in the doctor who was a female said yeah would you like to come in and see your granddaughter to her mother yeah. which so the her mother susan's mother held her granddaughter which plays in later yeah. in this story um and also she was at a florence crittenden home where they were kind to her you could say you didn't want to see your baby, never see your baby. And if you want to see your baby, they want you to be with them for seven days. And well, she tried you, to get out of it a little bit. Did early. you read why that was? Yeah. 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 It's, it had nothing to do with no. bonding or anything like that. It was simply logistics because they had to wait that long to get the adoption paper signed. Yeah. Yeah. But then so the nothing time, altruistic about no. that. But remotely. she did, but they encouraged her to stay the seven days, mm -hmm. which really hurt. She named her Karen, really mm -hmm. made her bond, which made me think, what does that do? You and I talked about this. I thought about this and made a note. I was with my mom for almost six days. Does that help you later than being taken immediately with secure attachments or any attachment? I like would I think a little bit any because probably, time, right? and, and probably the breastfeeding yeah. Um, the the holding, you know, because yeah. she did say that she heard babies crying, and then uh, they were like, "Oh no, no, they're not. They're okay. The nurses are holding them." You know, the nurses are holding them, and she wrote. She said something like, "Yeah, but they're crying constantly. They're not holding. I mean, there's not enough nurses to hold what was going on back then." Right. I know. Yeah, but so, I, I just have all these aha moments whenever I read this stuff. I'm like, huh? Or I have to ask you these things as we go through. And then there was something oh. so interesting yeah. about when she was 20, when Karen was 25 and mm -hmm. Susan was older, her neighbor, her next door neighbor, they became friends who was, a it turned out she was a child psychologist at the agency at yeah. Crittenden or wherever. And she said, well, have you searched? You must be a birth mother. Have you searched? And she's like, no, I, I didn't search. And the woman said, you need to search. So she found Karen within six weeks after that. Yeah. Um, and I that, her, that was kind of neat that the woman thought that and she had worked there. So she must have come to some realization along the way. You know? And then you, you've you talked about um, her. Yeah. The neighbor, you know, the other, the dinner parties. Yeah. So they, they, they would go to these dinner parties. Her mother moved back to her town when, when Karen was, um, Karen, the daughter who was given away was 13. Was it, she would have been 13. Yeah, mm -hmm. The mother moved back to their, this is weird. This is the sliding doors thing that I think is like genetic memory or something. Mm -hmm. The mother, her adopted mother, I mean, her mother, who Susan's her mother, away yeah. baby, Susan's mother moves back to town and kept saying that, that little girl, like she's here somewhere. She's here. I know she's here. And then mm -hmm. she said, my mother's got this gift. It turns out that this dinner party they used to go to all the time. Which Where Susan would leave and was, sob and was convinced sob. that their daughter was her daughter. Yeah. Convinced that their daughter was her daughter. They looked nothing alike. She just really bonded with this girl, loved this girl and would cry saying, that's my daughter. Same exact age. Turns out that daughter was friends with her daughter next with door. With Karen. I know. With Karen, who was next door all those years, living next door to that daughter and hanging out with that woman. Is that crazy? So crazy. And also... To circle back to the, to her mother, to Susan's mother, yeah. I think the holding of her, you know, she said that her mother was so torn up about the loss of, of the yeah. baby of Karen for all these years. And I think the, her holding, you know, had this yeah. been the case with so many in the baby oh. scoop era, I wonder if those parents, if they'd yeah. held the child, would it have changed anything? Um, 
Yeah, because we don't hear about that very much. And I don't think that happened very often. And then also, Laura, uh, Susan talks about how angry after the reunion, she realized how angry she and, was yeah. about it and that she could have parented and she that society, you know, this whole thing. So and birth mothers do not she forget, yeah. she says. Mm. They do not forget. Oh, yeah. that's so sad. Yeah, well, here's one thing she also said at the end. I often wonder if I, if he had, oh, this is about um, trying to kind of preserve her career. Like she actually went out one thing about Susan. She went out to do the best in her life to show her daughter that she was a good person. Like everything was for Karen. Like um, in her, in her or was life. that Jennifer who went, I think it might've been. No, I think, I think it's her because at the end she's like, um, well, anyway, I thought it was her because she was trying, she said she felt like all those moments that built up, she was destroying the person she had created when she let mm -hmm. it all go. Like it was a fake person or something. She well, was I, living in, is that the same? I, I, no, it's Jennifer because Jennifer, after she oh. had her baby, um, had this split oh, that she talks right. about where she says, Jennifer's um, our next woman, by the way, Jennifer's our next woman. But so after she said, looking out at the huge Texas sky, so the, I'm jumping ahead a bit, oh, right. that she hadn't taken him. She looked up at the sky and something lifted out of her. It was like a part of me was flying off, separating and leaving the other part of me. Later, mm. when people would ask me what it felt like to give my baby up for adoption, mm. the only words I could find to describe it was it felt like an amputation, like half of mm. my body had been removed. I can still feel that very powerfully. Her story was interesting. Oh. Because she and her boyfriend just were, I mean, having sex all over the place and like that, you know, had a couple of scares and then she thought yeah. she was invincible and then she did get pregnant, but they still stayed in denial. And then one day having sex on her parents, you know, in her at home on the, in the living room and her dad walked in, imagine how oh horrifying that would be like completely no. naked <laughs> in the living room. <laughs> So he's like, get upstairs, get dressed and follows her up. And then he's like, you're pregnant. And yeah, he, you know, then was he like five was months pregnant. Yeah. And then he was so torn up about, he's oh. like, this is my DNA too, you know? And, and he was so upset about giving up the baby and, you know, I, you have, I mean, why do you have to give up the baby then? But it, it kind of came down to his parents. Like the boyfriend's parents were more dominant. I felt like they mm -hmm. had more money and more dominating in the role. And she just wanted and, to not let anybody down. Yeah. The whole I'll thing. just do what I need to do because I've embarrassed you. And she didn't go to a home. She went to her no. sister's house in Texas. Um, no. And what was beautiful about going to her sister's house, she thought she never looked prettier. She loved this baby, loved being pregnant, just like any of us when you're pregnant. Yeah. Like loved, loved the baby. Like couldn't wait. Didn't really understand what was going to happen in a weird, I mean, it's just youth right? What's yeah. going to really happen? You don't, you just don't know. And then she just kept, no. then she wrote, I thought this was very sad. She wrote a letter to the adoptive parents when he was yeah. 16, I want to say. Yeah. Um, I think you're right. 19. 16. He was 19. He was 19. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And the parents were like, oh, we told him about it, but you know, he said, he asked us to hang on to it. And you know, obviously he probably had yeah. his own little adoptee guilt of man and, and also being a 19 year old boy. Kid. Yeah. <laughs> right. So there's that. So there's um, that. we've had that. And then she kept waiting 10 years and she was oh, getting yeah. anxious and yeah. And then but, she went to see Goodwill Hunting, which I thought yeah. actually made me cry because I, you know, that movie came out yes. right after. Becker was born. Yeah. 1990. Like, and I went to see it and he was, I, I think I might've even, you know, bundled it up, him up yeah. and taken him into the movie with me. me too, I remember that. <laughs> I remember that scene so well, you know, too. it's not your fault. And then yeah. she decides like, I'm going to call him. And then she gets home and her husband's like, your son's that your son was, called. He's, uh, that was another unbelievable moment. She literally was sobbing in the theater thinking it's not my fault. I'm going to call. And he, it's not your fault to him. Like yeah, to him. Yeah. She walked into the house and her husband was holding a glass of wine, a water and the phone. And she thought in her head, how could he hold all three things? And why is he doing this? And her son had called her. How is that? I know. These are those weird, both of these I weird know. moments like this. I think you should put on our Instagram, that quote you said, by the way, that she said about the amputee. 
mm-hmm. because that is so powerful. I thought it was almost the most powerful of the book, what you read, what she said. Then like, I know I will, do, I will do that. Then, um, she, oh, and then he, her son was kind of a known musician in Austin yeah. and, and she went and she went into the mosh pit and then he was on stage saying, is my mom okay? Is my mom okay? Which was, she oh. never expected him to call her mom. And I mean, no. just so many little, but after she gave birth, she had went and, you know, yeah, substance, use substances like we hear often yeah. through here and, and with adoptees. It's so common, like the threads of how similar adoptees and birth mothers, what they go through is shocking to me. I I don't know that I ever, this book is the most eye-opening book for that. Mm -hmm. For me, like, oh my gosh, what our mothers went through is what we've gone through in a different plane and how, Mm -hmm. and we're the most unheard voices in the adoption triad. So that's hopefully not for long. You know, it really makes you connect going, well, this is this is severance. Okay. Yeah. This is what, yeah. this is the damage of severance. Oh, you know? at the very end, I thought of you in particular and a little bit of me, because one thing about her, she became the successful person, but she always was stuck at 16, a little bit. Why'd you think, of, why'd you think that? of me that way? I, I thought, thought of, of me too. But... Well, <laughs> did you think of you? I thought of both of us in some ways, because I've had a lot of people tell me you're so much like you were as a kid. You're still, and I think you do become a little bit arrested in a certain time when you have trauma mm-hmm. yeah i, I think like so a too. lot of adoptees we know have this and i thought of you too i thought oh sarah and i have these weird things because she says i think in many many ways i'm stuck as a 16 year old mm-hmm. i dress like a 16 year old i like the music i can make just dis- mature decisions i have a husband a son a house i have a job i'm functioning as a seemingly mature adult but i do do feel like there's a part of me that's an arrested development that's the splitting off she talked about mm-hmm. yeah I think that goes both ways with adoptees too. I think so too. I mean, I still dress like I did at 16. (laughs) I have so many things where people are like, you're going to grow up. No, which is nice. I like that. But it, I do think that's, uh, I don't know. These were big ones. I feel like Anne kind of made this book so that, I don't know. She really laid this out so well. Yeah, she did. She's just such a brilliant book. I love it. So, I mean, I just, I, I'm so happy she did that, that she wrote this book. It's so, it was so important and vital. Yeah. Well, next week we will be chapter 10, talking and listening. Talking and listening and stay tuned for Lena. Stay tuned for Lena. See you in a minute, Louise. In a minute.